chapter four of the NASM Essentials of Personal Fitness Training. This is actually one of those, I guess, chapters that becomes very tough because you're kind of mixing into the world of psychology in some ways, but really behavioral coaching, yeah, it is a mental aspect of everything. You're trying to change the person's perception. But this is where we always coin like personal trainers, um, strength coaches, everybody. We got to get into that mental mindset. So this is where basically trying to make that change of behavior is going to become critical. So chapter four really revolves around all of those aspects. Okay. So what we want to do is just, you know, figure out the best techniques that we can do and work on really just building rapport and communication styles. So here we go. So what, you know, what are we expecting our, you know, of our clients at this point, you know, we want to make sure that they're getting everything that they need, right? Clients expectations and what really we want to see from the client perspective to the personal trainer is a lot of things like personalization, making eye contact, making sure that you're, you know, you give your name, you know, one of the things that I think sometimes throws me off, not just in this realm, but just in general, is that people when they say, Hello, how are you? It's like, okay, cool, who are you? You know, so just just giving your name and, and, and trying to get feedback, asking them a probing question, like, what's your name, you know, just those things make a huge difference. And sometimes just in passing, it really does help. Um, smiling, shaking hands, you know, just being appropriate in how you handle your your back and forth interactions. And then um, retention of names. That's really a key too. one of the things that when I was a phys ed teacher was, you know, students really bought into what you were trying to do if you know you were walking down the hallway and you remember their name you know just hey johnny you know da 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 da. this is what's going you know how's it going you know just asking questions like that and then they come into class and you can kind of feel the respect that's given at that point so and then the other part of it you know the expectation of a client is that you want to you know their expectation is they want to see positive body language, you know, or appropriate body language. So doesn't mean you can't be upset at something, but you don't want to sit there closed off, having arms folded, et cetera, et cetera. So we got to be making sure that we're trying to make our people feel comfortable, right? And our competency is going to increase their competency because they're going to trust us. Okay. What we want to think about too, and a little bit more of an expansion is looking the part, looking professional. There's this dilemma that we have, and, I, and I'm going to bring it up just because I think that it's necessary, but looking professional, looking the part, there's always this argument that, well, you know, personal trainers shouldn't be overweight. They should be fit. Like I, I've heard this a lot from my own personal students at the university. And you got to be very careful with that because just because you're overweight or I mean, maybe even in obese, it does not mean that you're not going to be a professional, the ultimate professional. It just means that you are a little bit overweight. You know, it's just, it's frustrating because the part that you're playing is to make people fit. But when you don't have that, I think sometimes it can be a turnoff, but it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. I mean, I, I don't really know much more to say about that because it, it, it's a frustrating question that people ask and the best, you know, some of the best personal trainers could be slightly overweight, but they're going to get beat out by somebody who looks better than them, which is, you know, unfortunate in some ways, but it, you know, it, it it's, it's a client's preference at that point. So you just got to be very careful with that, especially when you start getting up into the rank of being like a supervisor, you, you don't, you know, that's something you can, you know, you cannot and should not push. It's just that the expectation is there. I mean, and I'll be perfectly honest back when I first started training, I was more of a power lifter at that point. So I had a little bit more excess weight than what I do now. And it's really, it's really kind of crazy how just, see, you know, people seeing you on the floor and doing what you normally do, but then when they see you in person, they get a different perspective on everything because you work hard, 
and it looks like you're overweight, but you're really not. So it just, it's really weird. It's a really weird question that I've been asked. And I know it's kind of frustrating to kind of talk about because the dialogue can always be brought farther with that, but you know, you do you, but if you, you know, I'll give myself, even though I might've been slightly overweight at that point in time, you know, I did make sure I was well groomed. I took care of how I looked in terms of how I dressed. You know, I didn't I still played that part of the ultimate professional. All right. Because my the next bullet there though, I tried building trusting relationships. And once people figured out that I knew what I was talking about, just like you all know what you're talking about, it, it just it makes more sense, you know, that they they can trust you, even though, you know, I might have been a little bit overweight. Um feel heard and understood that's anything that's quality relationships 101 that's at home that's at work that's with you know friends you oh you know you don't ever want to feel unheard and you, you know if people misunderstand you it, it's it's frustrating so a client can't feel that trust or build that quality environment they want if they don't feel hurt like they you're not taking their considerations into account safety you know, ensuring your clients are always safe. That's one of the things that drives me nuts. That's why going to a box gym for me is frustrating because I look around and I'm like, oh, these personal trainers, what are you doing? You know, and I'm just, and you want to go over there and say something so bad because you know that that client could get hurt and you're just like, it's not your place. Maybe there's a reason and you stay out of it, but you see it's time and time again and it becomes frustrating. All right. And then lastly, building a community to make your client's exercise routine a collaborative effort. It's the collaborative effort between your your input and your work to their output and their work. Right. That's what we're looking for. So, you know, with the environment, right, it's going to be a, a really interesting thing, because as great of a trainer as you are, what's your environment like, you know, and that really becomes a big thing. So like it says here, the training environment can either hinder or foster intrinsic motivation. If you go into a gym and uh, um, there's, there's heavy metal playing, love, I, I'm not knocking that, love hearing hard music playing. But you get somebody who, you know, they, they don't get that motivation, that amp that I would if they hear that type of, you know, they might get intimidated. So therefore, intrinsic motivation or doing it for the purpose of doing it for them might turn them off. That's just one thing, you know, that's one example of how that can work. All right. And like it says here, the most successful health clubs work hard to create a third space environment. A third space is like it says a communal space. It takes away that separation from home or work. And you feel like you have an identity. You can relate to that area. That's your, that's your third home, right? Work home, home. And then on top of that, you have your gym home, right? Those all can come into play. So that checklist down below is, is one of those things that really can, can help, you know, with the consideration before they're joining a gym. Well, they have to join a gym before they can become your client, you know, variety of training options, training environment that's supportive. Does it look like, or feel like they're going to fit into the culture of the environment of that fitness location? Cost, cost of membership, cost of personal training. Is it convenient to where they are? Is it on their way home? Do they have to drive a half an hour? And the last one, which is one of the more important ones, especially when you walk in, is is the place clean and neat? Well, I'm sorry. Some of the coolest facilities that I've been to and some of the most intimidating but challenging facilities I've been to, they're like those grunge style gyms where, you know, they might sweep once a week and they never use a mop, you know, (laughs) and I'm just being very aggressive on that. But you understand what I'm saying is that not every place has to have the glimmer and the the glimmer and the, the sparkle and like it has to have everything amazing. And some people just don't want that. So what turns them on, what turns them off? That's really kind of critical for that. So what do we do? What do we do when we want a person to change a behavior, right? We, we got them in the door, we got them feeling comfortable, but now it's like, oh, I have never worked out before. Well, that's going to be a massive undertaking with their behavior, right? So we have to be aware of that. The other critical part with behavior change is what is their self-efficacy level? What is their feelings toward the belief in their abilities? 
Can they do something? Or can they not do anything and we're going to build that self-efficacy one day at a time and make them better every single day that they come in, right? That's what I do in my own personal training, you know, personal like my own training. And I'm sure you probably do the same thing. You're trying to get that one little bit better every day, right? Um, so there's ways that you can do that. Set specific tasks. Yeah, you have to. You can't be all willy-nilly all over the place, right? You have to provide instructions. And that this goes for you and for anybody. Provide instructions. You have to have a detailed way of doing things. You have to practice for mastery. You, you have to get good at movements before you can get good at the next movement and the next movement. I always tell my students in class, it's one of those things where practicing for mastery. You cannot multiply and divide unless you know how to add and subtract. You know, it's, kind of, it's that progression. And then lastly, there's that communication style that, you know, being able to positively communicate and building that rapport. All of those things are going to come in handy when it's building up their ability, which will then increase their ability to change their behavior as they become, you know, more in tune to what they're doing. What else do we want to do? We want to supply information. That's where the education of everything comes in. Knowing. And you have to be that person that knows. One of the things that I think is scary is that we all can read a textbook on something and pass a test, but really are we supplying the right information? So just, you know, you got the, you know, once you get this exam out of the way, then it's you building your toolbox and being able to su supply more information than what NASM's guidelines just say. It doesn't mean that what they're giving you is wrong or what I'm explaining to you is wrong. It's just that you need to be able to build it and, and, and not solely stick to the script. Okay. There needs to be a prompt anticipated regret. So what that, what we're saying there is what would be the difference between now versus changing, you know, what are the con, you know, what consequences come from not changing? So I get really, you know, thrown off when I miss a training day. So, because my consequences immediately go, and this may not be the healthiest, but for me, it works is, you know, the consequences, like, I don't want to fall out of not being consistent. So I have to maintain that. So there's that slight regret there. All right. And then apply motivational interviewing. It, it's exactly like it sounds. You're in, what's an interview. You're asking questions. You're probing. You're trying to find more details so that you can be a better guide for them and make them think critically on what they need to change. Right. It's all about them. It's you helping them to establish them. Encouraging social support, right? This is that social influence. Friends, family, meeting new people, all of that's really important because, and I've, I've said this before to a lot of people, is that, you know, social support is critical when you're, especially when you leave the personal trainer or if you're trying to get, if the personal trainer is trying to get them to be, you know, a little bit more autonomous and doing things on their own. And, and I think, you know, encouraging people to reach out to members that are already established and then not being intimidated by everybody. That's one of the things that I always look for is finding the people that you know are going to be intimidating, bringing your people around them and, and you, because you already have the relationship with these people, they'll help to understand like, no, everybody's in here to do them and they're not looking at you. Sometimes if they're looking at you, they might be trying to help you for all you know. So that's really challenging. And then you have to foster discipline, right? Resisting social pressure is hard. It's hard for anybody. It's hard for anybody in any circumstance, whether it be in the gym, at work, going out to lunch, going to a Broadway show, whatever it might be. So social influence has massive impact. So we have to foster discipline and know that social pressures are not aimed at you and they're not meant, you know, there isn't we're trying to, to almost like dismiss that there's no social pressure. That's tough, but that's what we're looking for is by managing our social influences, we can help them to understand that there's other people that are out there to help them and that we're there to help them as well, but look for other additional supports. So with self-regulation, how do we self-regulate? 
We need to make a plan. You have to develop proper coping mechanisms or coping responses. If there are things that get in your way, air quotes, barriers, how do we get over them? And, and that's what we're teaching our people is there is, you know, there, the barriers are only as high as you make them. So if you're making this barrier bigger than what it is, it's going to be a lot harder to, you know, get over it, you know, get over that barrier, get over that hump, right? Set smart goals, short and long term, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time sensitive or timely, right? And then self monitoring. Find ways to monitor. I use the I use a gym app, right? That's how I monitor my progression. And then if I really need to, I write things down. And I've gone away from paper and pencil, and I've gone to inside of that app. I leave notes so that they're more de they're detailed and they're in the now. Not that I, it's just easier for me to do it versus writing everything out. But I do write things out, you know outside of that, but that's neither here nor there. It's just one of those things where, you know, self monitoring, you have to be able to keep records because you want to always show progression and not only progression, the other word that I just saw, and it was adherence, especially for new people or people coming back. Adherence is critical. And that's by changing that behavior, we can increase adherence. So self-regulation is, you know, trying to promote that is optimal. So, you know, what do we, you know, like it says here, determinants of participation, right? There's a few things that we have to understand. There's a few theories. There's a few ways that we can go about doing this. Now, there's something called the self-determination theory, and that's really more about the motivational styles of everything. Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to get them to understand that they can, you know, self-determination. We're trying to get them to believe that they they can achieve something and that by them being determined to do it will increase adherence. It'll increase self-efficacy. It'll help them become regulated. It'll help them keep um, proper records of what they're doing. And then from there, image change, better social cues or social support. They might want to, you know, they start changing how they look because they feel better about themselves. All those things can help them because they feel more determined and then they feel more positive about working out. There's also something called autonomous motivation. And that's just being motivated, motivate, motivate, motivated, motivated by you, by what you are. If you, if you can get your clients to see the, their own identity, their identity will show through by becoming more self-aware, being more, um, having higher levels of self-efficacy, being more motivated, more self-motivation, right? And then from there, all those can lead to proper planning, better attitudes. They can, their outcome expectations will be different. They're not going to see things. They may or may not see things more, more negatively. They might look more positively. And then from there, decreases in stress. And they have what we call perceived behavioral control. Now they're being limited in, you know, they're being limited in things and trying to be more healthy in others. So there's always that aspect of it, okay? So we, we need to make sure we are aware of that. So that's just physical activity and exercise in general. With resistance training, what they're saying here is something we call effective judgment. And effective when we say the word effective it means emotional state like it's when we teach everybody in a physical education setting there's there's three domains and one of those domains is the effective domain and that's that feeling domain how do you feel so when we say the effective judgment we're talking about like it says there expected pleasure or joy okay and then from there looking at everything subjective norms right now we're starting to see the opinion of others that comes in and now that you're becoming accepted or you're gaining that approval from others that will only engage you more. You'll build proper um, relationships with, you know, and then feel more confident in lifting weights. So there's always that turn there. But going back to here, you know, determination, determinants of participants. Now it's like, okay, that's great. We have these theories. We have these thoughts. We have these angles that we're looking for. So what are we going to do? Well, we need to figure out how to change. And one of them, I want to say one of the most common aspects is what we call the stage of change model or what we call the trans theoretical model. Now, the trans theoretical model has 
five listed here. And then sometimes you might see a six. I'll talk about that briefly, but I don't think you're going to get tested upon that. So you're going to go through these five stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance, right? So with pre-contemplation, you're, you're, it's pre, right? It's, it's before your thought. So you may have thought, you know, that there was, you saw a commercial on TV, but didn't pay it any mind, right? There's no exercise or training plans within the next six months or roughly, you know, these aren't written in stone, but around six months. Contemplation means that you're starting to think about this a little bit more and you're starting to devise a little bit more of a plan. And usually that plan will start to take effect within the next six months. Now, you're contemplating. Now, preparation, you're taking steps forward, meaning that you may have gone to a gym once and you're like, oh, this seems kind of interesting. I really think that I need to do a little bit more digging and, and, and you're planning a little bit more, right? But you're not consistent. You're like one week here, you're doing one or two exercise days. The next week you might not do any. The next week you might do one. So it's just it's kind of on off, but you're planning and you're trying to figure out soon that you're going to make that effort. Action. Now you're starting to do regular exercising. You're past the preparation. Now you're doing a regular exercise program, but it's about six months or less. If you get to that point, right, you're doing it. But once you get to that maintenance, that's a regular occurrence of six months or more. And then what we teach inside of our coursework is a sixth stage, which is called termination, which means that you've adapted it to your lifestyle and you really don't have a feeling that you're going to go back in that direction. Right? So if you look at the right hand side there on the left side of that picture, you're going to see the progress is going down. So your progression going from all of those means that you're, you're improving. Now, if there is a relapse at that point, meaning that you fall back in some way, that means that you're gonna, it, it depends on how far you have lapsed in that time. So if you relapse all the way and stop exercising, you might have to restart everything in pre-contemplation. If you got to a point where you've been training for six months or, or less, and at the four month mark, you kind of fell off the wagon a little bit, well, that just means that you have to go back to the drawing board. Well, where do you fall back? However far it took you. So if you were ongoing for four months straight and then you took two weeks off, well, do you, are you going to fall all the way back to pre-contemplation? No, it's, you're probably going to be either back in the preparation. So devising a new plan for a very short period of time and then right back to your action. Cause now you're making a new habit of it and trying to figure out what went wrong and then you move on from there. So it just depends. All of these are, they're very dynamic and it's an evolution. So it's, it's a cycle. And if you fall off of a little bit, the cycle will start again at wherever you fell off and you keep resuming forward until it becomes a regular habit. That's what your trans theoretical model is all about. So now you've gotten to that point. Well, what do we got to do? We got to be able to be effective community. You know, we have to find ways to be effective communicators. And if we can be effective communicators, then our ability to make behavior changes is impeccable. All right. By being a good communicator, you're going to be able to create a safe environment. You're going to find ways to diminish distractions. There's an ability to ask questions and get answers back and forth. Remember, we have this two way street. They ask, you answer, you ask, they answer, you know, and we are trying to always do that. Effective communication doesn't always mean verbal. So now we have to be better at nonverbal communication. Your eyes are critical. Your facial features are critical. Your hands and where they go, your posture and how you stand, all of those mean something when you're, you know, communicating with somebody. Um, I, the last few years I was coaching CrossFit and, you know, in that group in a group fitness style, and one of the things that I do a lot is I cross my arms. Now, crossing my arms, usually that would mean that we're, you know, basically being closed off and we don't want anybody to, you know, talk to us. But in my regard, when I cross my arms, 
my athletes knew that I was it, that was my serious moment and I'm in tune to what's going on, you know. And I've had newer people say, "Hey, you know, are you is everything okay?" And I'm like, "No, no, no. I I want you to know that I stand with my arms crossed because that's my way of saying that I'm intent on everything that's going on and I'm focused. So, you know, by me providing that, there's my communication. I'm communicating how my nonverbal works, right? Now, providing empathy and validation, that's always going to be critical there. So just remember, communication skills, not just nonverbal, not just verbal. We have to be a mixture of both, but we want to make it safe without distractions to be able to ask questions and give answers and have an understanding so that we can be, be you know, making it better for everybody. So, you know, nonverbal, verbal we, we need to make sure that we're listening, being active listeners, being reflective listeners. And basically what we're saying here is starting at one, two, three, and four, we're always going through this cycle, right? And this will eventually help us to eliminate confusion, all right? So with number one, you're talking about what the speaker means, which follows by what the speaker says, with what the listener hears and what the listener thinks the speaker means, so it's, it's one of those things where if you're not listening, you're going to miss one of these steps and then the listening process has been broken down. So therefore you have not caught the meaning of what was being said. So therefore you end up with bad communication and therefore you can't give the right correction or the right uh, modification or get to the right results that you're looking for. So it's always this vicious cycle but if the if what the listener thinks the speaker means is accurate to what the speaker means, four to one, then we're on the right path. Okay. So there's always this ebb and flow in this cycle that we have to pay attention to. If you're gonna talk over somebody, then you're not being a reflective listener or even an active listener. If you're trying to answer a question before the question is already, you know, you're not gonna know what they mean. All right. Or you're not going to hear what they say. So therefore you won't know what they mean. And then it just breaks down in multiple ways. So there's your active listening. All right. So like it says here, not just about talking when others are not right. Just because there's dead air does not mean that you have to fill that dead air. Right. But what are we looking to do? We want to have a genuineness to us. We want to make sure that it's aimed at, you know, getting a client's perspective and understanding somebody way deeper than just on the exterior. Okay. So again, you don't have to fill in dead air with talk, talk, talk. No, there, you know, they might not be talking for a certain reason and you should not be asking questions at that point for a certain reason. Not everything has to be filled in that way. Don't fill in the gaps unless it's necessary. All right. So what are they saying? Individuals, you know, requires you to, you know, pay attention, suspend any internal dialogue. So you shouldn't, you know, you and your client should not be, you know, really going off of like, oh, well, I wonder what I'm going to have for lunch. Well, if you're worried about what's going on for your lunch in a half an hour after this client session, you're not actively listening. So there's an, a distraction. Keep your eyes focused on that person and look at them. All right. Now, let's be honest. There, there are some times where looking at each other in the eyes, that may not happen, right? Um, I'm gonna give you an example. I had a, uh, you know, I had a female who did not look me in the eyes when she talked to me, and I, and she was very shy. But I had to find ways to communicate with her and make and, and make me. I had to understand when she was directly asking me something because it just, it was very tough. So we learned and we built that rapport and we figured out how to make it work where even though she may not be looking directly at me in the eyes, I know that she's referring to something and I have to figure that out. So, um, and then you have to make sure that, you know, if, if you're, if you have this good back and forth, you know, provide feedback. One of the worst things that I can do to my students or my athletes or my exercisers is not give something back. Meaning if you did something positive, negative, or neutral, 
there still needs to be something given back and and but you're but by actively listening you can give quality feedback all right so what do we got to do ask questions we have to reflect we have to go back and look back and see what happened we have to summarize without going too deep into something sometimes people lose you when you use too many words we have to affirm and then we also have to ask permission all these things will fit the mold of being an active listener and building rapport so that individuals can feel comfortable with you and you can feel comfortable with them and you have this great back and forth without any, any hiccups. So what do we want? Closed-ended, open-ended, right? Yes or no's, simplistics, um, more directives of, of state something. That's closed-ended. Open-ended means this is what I'm asking of you. What do you got? Okay. Open-ended questions. That's usually, so really closed ended is more like if you were to take a test, a multiple choice question is more closed ended. True or false is more closed ended. Open ended is more short answer and essay, right? That's what we're kind of, so if you think about those style of questions that you might get asked on a test, that's what we're referring to. Reflecting, summarize, affirming, and asking permission. All of these things are meant for you to be able to get more out of a person and, and be able to actively listen. You know, we're being reflective. You're trying to figure out what is being meant by what is heard and you reflect on it. You look back on it, right? So by listening intently and hearing what a person's saying, you have a better understanding through the reflection process. Um, think about reflection as like the person's dialogue, but they're, but pretend like it's a dialogue that they were writing in their journal, right? But they're saying it out loud. That's kind of what reflection is. They're, you're looking back at it. Summarizing, you know, right? You're, it's, it's really a series of reflections. If you summarize, it's more than one reflection of the whole process. Affirming, that's just being able to give positive statements about something that has occurred and it's not a compliment, but it's affirming. It's being strong in your positive statement about what was done correctly or to their strength, right? And then asking permission, like it says, allows clients to retain autonomy while making it easier to hear what you say as the professional, okay? So if they're, if they're asking permission, that means that they're learning and that they're trying to build on what they already have. So therefore, what do we end up with? Something like motivational interviewing, motivational interviewing, client centered, directive method for enhancing intrinsic motive inside motivation, not gifts or prizes or something else or getting a cheat meal, but for themselves to change by exploring and resolving ambivalence. All right. So at that point, what we're doing is we're, we're really just trying to find ways to be, you know, in, in a sense of empathy, being collaborative, being, well, obviously we never want to be non-confrontational and then being goal oriented in how you're communicating so that you can help these people change their lives and be actively positive and actively trying motivation to move forward. So we want to make sure we're giving our people the right styles and the right questions and the right ability feelings so that they can move forward. And so applying this motivational interviewing is you're going to have something what we call self discrepancy, uh, discrepancy. So what we have there is like it says an internal conflict when really an individual compares their actual self with their ideal self. And if we get them to really get that closer, then this self discrepancy is minimized and their actual self is getting closer to what they ideally want to be. But with motivational interviewing, we're getting them to be understanding of how, you know, they feel about what they are to what they hope to be. And that makes a big difference. All right. So self discrepancy, although challenging, we all have it and we all have a certain level of it, but the closer we can get of who we are to what we want to be means that you're going to have a higher level of motivation to continuously change and be better here. I'm not going to go too much into this because you can see down in the bottom, 
questions that you can use. Let's see here, questions that provoke resistance. Well, we don't want that. You know, if you're if you're causing resistance, that that leads to arguments, that leads to being defensive. All right, we you know, or questions that promote change. That's a little bit more, you know, of a, of a open of open communication and 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 creating a better motivation, right? So we have to be aware of that and make sure that we don't allow the resistance to increase when we want to promote change. If you're going to say, why can't you make this change to your schedule? That's really not the best way to do it. You know, so we got to, you know, like it says, if you decide to make this change, what would be different in your life? And schedule might be one of them. So you, you see how there's a difference versus causing arguments. Or, or or defensiveness. So you know another you know, there's another way change commitment check. F you know how do you feel on these scales of one to ten? How important do you feel making the, this change in your life? Uh, you know. How confident are you that you can make this change happen? How ready are you to start making this change today? All of these things can really help you to see where the motivation lies and to see where the commitment is. And then strategies to enhance adherence, right? Smart goals. We, were, we talked about those early. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. If you're missing some of these components, then the goal will can seemingly fall apart. And that's a problem. So the, the main thing here is that not one of these is more important than the other. But when you miss one, then you're missing the basically the gist of a goal. And the other thing about exercise adherence with SMART goals, do not create a SMART goal for somebody. They have to be the ones that are creating their goals. You can assist them, but ultimately goals are meant to be made by the person and not by the trainer because therefore they don't have the commitment. When they set their own goals, their commitment is there. When we set it for them, it's like, oh, well, they did. I, I didn't say I was going to do that so that it can always come back against you. So just be aware. So keeping on going, you know, what are we looking for? Outcome goals and process goals, right? Outcome goals are things that are going to be for end results or goal consequences. And process goals are those goals that we're hitting as we go through every process we get to, right? The, it's, it's about the process more than the outcome. Now, one is not better than the other. It's just some people do them different ways. Sometimes different goals require an outcome or a process depending upon what you're trying to achieve. Right. Um, my goal, not me, per, but just say my goal is to run a marathon. That's more of an outcome goal. My goal is to each week increase my mileage by five miles. That's a process goal. Right. Because it's a, it's a process you're going to, you know, it's it's step by step. So therefore, you know, we're, we're getting our motivation up. You know, we're getting our, we're, we're, we're setting goals. Now it's about enhancing self-efficacy or the belief that we can do it. So really by planning, we can create these certain intentions or behavioral techniques that are aimed toward situational cues of the who, what, when, where, why, and how basically. And we have to be able to that by proper planning, we can diminish that issue. And if we know the who, what, when, why, or hows, then we can basically say that our plan was intact. And then we have to be able to develop a coping plan. So if something gets jacked up and messed up greatly, we know how to cope with it, move on, and still realize that our ability is there. You know, if a person can't do a pull-up, then we have to provide coping mechanisms for them to be able to say, okay, that barrier is there. I don't know how to, I can't do a pull-up, but I can do these in the interim and then eventually that pull-up will come. That's keeping the ability level up without making them lose hope. That's what we're looking for. We talked about self-monitoring and just finding strategies to help you and record and be able to say that you're getting to the steps of the goal that you've set. Right. And by self monitoring, you see those changes, you see those progressions. It also says here it allows you to identify external triggers that make you believe in a certain way. So recording, 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 recording. Right. All that is necessary. 
Then we get into these cognitive strategies or now cognitive is another one of those domains I was talking about, the cognitive domain, and that's more about thought. Well, here we're talking about positive self-talk. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking positively about yours, and that's more, you know, it could be internal dialogue, it could be out loud, all those things make a really big difference, right? Um, self-talk, exactly what we just talked about, reverse listing. So what we're doing is we're reversing, we're taking the negative out of something and implementing a positive in there. And then stopping. Um, or, or sometimes psychologists call it a pause, taking a pause. All of those things really come into play when helping us to be positive in our self-talk. There's imagery, another good co you know, cognit cognitive strategy. And that's basically internalizing mentally everything that's out there. And that's really just seeing what you're going to be doing before you even do it. Um, we worked with our basketball players a lot with this. And that's, you know having them close their eyes for a second, take five seconds, you know, count to five, look at you, take a shot in your brain from an outside perspective. Like you're a video camera watching yourself shoot, now do it. You know, and by having them see it, they see it, they feel it, the energy's there. Internally, they understand what they have to do. They've done it a million times and it can help create a better thought process. And then psyching up, there is a certain level of, you know, there's a certain level of psyching up that you can do without becoming overly aroused. And there's always what we call this optimal arousal level. And it, we, we can, you know, get to that point. A perfect example is I remember like, a, oh, I forget how long ago it was, but the opening kickoff of the Super Bowl and the Seahawks had the ball kicked off to them and the I forget who it was. The player dropped the, the, the kickoff on the very first play of the game, dropped it, caused a fumble. The other team got it. That whole situation means that they had increased their arousal level and they got too psyched up that it caused them to be out of their mind. Basically, they weren't their normal self. So we have to be real. You know, they were overly ready and that hurt them mentally and that caused the mistake physically. So we have to be aware that although we can psych ourselves up, we can't get too psyched up because that can ultimately be a negative as well. So what do we see, right? We have these initial sessions, right? We want to see, you know, through the process, you have this initial meeting. You want to make sure you get all the health concerns out of the way. You want to talk about goals. What is your past experiences? And then eventually we want to figure out the right program and finalize it so that the, you know, we're ready to go. Now that doesn't mean you're going to have a whole eight week exercise pl program planned out, but you're going to finalize the program, meaning you're going to finalize. What are we going to do? Does this person need uh, interval training? Does this person need more resistance training with some cardio or vice versa? So you can see where you can figure it out because you know what their goals are. You've asked them, you've talked to them, you know what their health concerns are, if there are any. So that makes a big difference. And that can be made up in that initial session. That doesn't take long to figure out. And, and by figuring it out then, it makes you as the trainer ready to start programming correctly. Or actually, with before you even program, you can finalize the program and then work on what are the assessments we're going to do to then make the program. All right. So... Lot to lot to pull in here. You know, psychology is very, very tough on this one. But if we go back, what was the whole aspect of here? Behavioral coaching, right? Right back to behavioral coaching. If we get our people in the right frame of mind and get them to be more motivated, have a, a belief in their ability, and be able to communicate effectively and get over, you know, really get over barriers of change, we can get them to adhere better. And that's the key. All right. So chapter four, again, a little bit different, not much. It is exercise oriented, but it's still the psychology of exercise that we need to understand. Okay. So any questions, always feel free to reach out. One of the things is this is a newer video that I made. And if you're listening to the end, I do have PDFs and I have word based documents of these slides. I do charge a nominal fee for them. So if you do have them, and you do need them, please feel to reach out. My email is there. 
my LinkedIn profile, my Instagram, they're all there. Please feel free to reach out, follow me, whatever you wanna do, ask questions. I can create cool new videos. I'm trying to expand that. So let's keep rolling. Everybody have a great day and I hope to hear from you soon.